okay welcome back so in this video and in the next video i'll be talking about the topic of latent heat so in this video i'll be talking about the topic of latent heat of vaporization and in the next top, next video i'll be talking about the latent heat of fusion so to begin those these two videos there may be some users who are not aware about the topic of latent heat so first of all before describing the experiment and the theories that i'll be discussing here let me explain you what is meant by the latent heat of a substance now if you take a sample of water for example and say that the initial temperature of the system is 20 degrees of celsius or 393 kelvin and you increase the temperature by means of a heater or elect electrically or bunsen burner or any other method right you increase the temperature of the system by providing heat and uh, this increase in temperature say it goes to a temperature of 50 degrees of celsius or 323 kelvin so you know that from the equation q equals mc theta that i discussed in the last video you can if you know the value of theta if you know the value of m and c you can calculate the heat similarly if you know the value of q or the amount of heat supplied and if you know the value of temperature change temperature change you can calculate the specific heat capacity of the substance given the mass so those were discussed in the last video so a similar phenomenon happens here the only difference between the normal heat provided to a substance and the concept of latent heat is that latent heat is the heat released or absorbed by a body or a thermodynamic system during a constant temperature process now what did they mean by this now, ex now to explain this I'll take a simple example. I'll take the sim same sample of water. I'll take the same sample of water and I will provide the heat at zero degrees of Celsius. Now zero degrees of Celsius is simply the melting point of the 273 Kelvin is the melting point of water. So I'll supply heat to water at that temperature. Now you know that if I decrease the temperature by even a point of a celsius or point of a kelvin this water after some time may take its next sh uh, the phase next phase which is the ice and when i provide heat that means when i increase the heat when i increase the temperature it will convert to water now if you take a simple substance if you take a simple substance say if you take some uh, ice and if you keep it on the hand and if you uh, measure the temperature when ice converts to liquid right when ice converts to liquid you can see that the temperature doesn't change the temperature stays at zero degrees of celsius a similar effect can be seen at 100 degrees of celsius which is the boiling point so at the boiling point when water changes its state or the phase from liquid to gas or water vapor in fact Okay, so in the gaseous mode so what happens is that the temperature stays constant while providing heat so that type of heat in which when you provide the heat it changes into a next state right when it changes into a next state but the temperature doesn't change such a phenomenon is the uh, phenomenon of latent heat so latent heat may be observed during various phase changes from liquid to solid vice versa and solid to gas and even gas to liquid right and vice versa all right so that's about a simple introduction about latent heat so as i mentioned in the concept of the general equation q equals mc theta in which the heat is equal to the mass times uh, the specific heat capacity times the temperature difference i explained to you about what is meant by the specific heat capacity of a substance now a similar equation can be formed for the specific latent heat or for the latent heat in fact and for the specific latent heat so now you you can think now if i take some amount of water right if i take some amount of water and uh, if i take now actually now you should know that since the temperature is not changing temperature is not a part of this equation right so we don't take theta or any other variable as the temperature and as a part of temper uh, as a part of the equation so only the mass and the specific latent heat are the quantities that we take here so if you take two samples in which one is water and another one say another liquid uh, say aniline or something 
right a simple liquid i just took a simple example so what actually happens when you provide heat to these two samples is that at some temperature for water it's 100 degrees celsius but for aniline i don't know what is the its boiling point right but uh, we don't know we don't want what is what is the boiling point of aniline so if you take the same mass you can see that the heat provided the heat that should be provided to make these two samples one in one in which we have water and the other one in which we have aniline we have to give different heats or even though the masses are equal say you take 100 grams of water and 100 grams of aniline you can measure the volume and you can multiply by the density at that temperature and find the mass so and also you can measure the mass so even though the mass is similar you can see that the heat needed to change its state or phase is different so as the specific latent heat is described in the case of vaporization right specific latent heat of vaporization l of a substance is the heat quantity right heat quantity required to convert one unit mass of a sub liquid into water vapor at its boiling limit right so this is i actually defined for water so you can define a similar step right similar actually an equation uh, for another substance as well so q equals ml now you know that uh, the unit of q here is the heat so its unit is joule and for mass which is m its unit is kilogram so l's unit will be q over m so q is joules and mass is kilogram so its unit is joules so in this video i'll be explaining about a sample experiment in which we find the specific latent heat of vaporization of water so to find the specific latent heat, latent heat we use a simple experiment like this and use a setup like this in which uh, we have a heater or a boiler here and we actually we pour water here and uh, with a bunsen burner we heat this right we heat this and there's an emergency tube so i'll explain that in the middle of the video as to why we have an emergency tube and we have another tube here so that uh, now when water uh, actually go past 100 degrees of celsius so we don't actually allow water to go past 100 degrees of celsius so when water reaches 100 degrees of celsius steam is formed inside this boiler so steam passes through this tube like this and goes over to the heat stove so we use heat insulators so I, I will also explain about the effect of heat insulators you may already know by now but uh, for for those who you don't know as to why heat insulators are used here i'll explain in the actually the part of the or the section of important points so we have the glass tube and this is the heat store so heat store is uh, actually an instrument which is used to gather gather steam we have the inlet here and the outlet here and uh, when steam comes here when steam arrives here steam will be distributed throughout the heat store and after some time that heat will that steam will go past through this outlet towards the calorimeter so when thinking about the calorimeter we have a stirrer here and a thermometer to measure the temperature so we actually don't uh, although we see here that we are just touching the water surface we actually don't touch the water surface we are just merely touching it just uh, as close as possible to the water surface but we don't uh, immerse the tube or we don't just touch the water surface as well so i'll explain all those in the uh, important point section so in this experiment uh, uh, a special concept of future latent heat is used so let's investigate as to how we can do this experiment now so let's take the mass of the calorimeter and the stirrer combined as m1 and the mass of the calorimeter stirrer and the cold water right and the cold water combined as m2 the initial temperature of water as theta1 the final temperature of water as theta2 the combined mass of the calorimeter stirrer water and steam as m3 furthermore let's assume that the specific heat capacity of the calorimeter is c the specific heat capacity of water is cw and the specific latent heat of vaporization of water as l now you know from the heat or uh, the calorimetric equation 
you can say that assuming that the heat loss to the environment is negligible you can say that the heat loss by some system is equal to the heat gained by some system now the system that gains heat is actually the calorimeter and the cold water system and the heat that loses heat or uh, emits heat right emits heat is the water that is condensed at 100 degrees of celsius and that of steam so you can say that uh, by modifying that expression you can say latent heat emitted by steam plus heat emitted by water that contains at 100 degrees of celsius so that is the system that emits heat or loses heat is equal to the system that gains heat which is the heat gained by the calorimeter and cold water therefore you can say so the latent heat emitted by steam is actually its mass so its mass is m3 minus m2 because you know when you reduce these two equations right when you reduce these two equations the mass of steam will be m3 minus m2 times the specific latent, latent heat of vaporization of water so that's the latent heat emitted by steam plus the heat emitted by water that contains at 100 degrees of celsius is that now the same mass is taken right because you know that the mass steam steam is the uh, steam converts into water that contains at 100 degrees of celsius so the same mass should be taken which is m3 minus m2 and you have to multiply that by the specific heat capacity of water which i took as cw and the temperature difference 100 minus theta 2 so theta 2 being the final temperature and that is the total heat loss or total heat emitted by the system and the total emitted ga heat gained by the by another system is the heat gained by the calorimeter and the cold water so we have to write the expressions individually so the heat gained by the calorimeter is equal to the mass of the calorimeter which is m1 now let's take the mass of the stirrer to be negligible so the mass of the, the mass of st the stirrer and the calorimeter is the can be uh, approximately equal we can consider that it is approximately equal to the mass of the calorimeter so that is m1 times the specific heat capacity of the calorimeter c times the temperature difference so the final initial temperature of the uh, calorimeter and the cold water is theta 1 and the final temperature is theta 2 so the temperature difference is theta 2 minus theta 1 and that's for the calorimeter and the stir and when you're thinking about the cold water you can say that the mass of water mass of cold water when you reduce these two equations when you reduce these two equations you can say the mass of cold water is now equal to m2 minus m1 times its uh, when you think about the heat it times its uh, specific heat capacity which is cw times the temperature difference theta 2 minus theta 1 now you can measure m3 m2 cw you know where the value of cw you don't have to measure it theta 2 uh, and here m1 you know the value of c and uh, theta 1 here as well right so you can measure all those you can measure the masses the temperatures and you know the values of cw and c so the value that you don't know here is l so using this equation we can find the specific latent heat of vaporization of water so to find that we need to do the experiment that i discussed a little while ago so this is the experiment that i'll be doing here so i'll set up the apparatus as shown and boil water in the boiler next what i'll do is i'll fill about three four of the three fourth of the volume of cal calorimeter with water now three fourth of the volume of calorimeter is important because we have to fill steam as well so when steam and the water condensed at 100 degrees of celsius adds the volume increases so we have to resist all those uh, all that volume inside the calorimeter so we don't completely fill the calorimeter with water we fill it about three fourth and then we add some ice cubes and water to a beaker and immerse the calorimeter in the beaker so i'll explain as to why we insert some ice cubes in the important point section of this video and uh, then what we do is we measure the temperature so you know that when the, uh, when we add ice the temperature goes down so when the temperature of the calorimeter decreases by about six to seven degrees of celsius we take the calorimeter out of the beaker now we put the calorimeter we put ice into the beaker and we measure the temperature until it say the initial temperature is say um, actually some temperature say 30 degrees of celsius and we can say the final temperature should be around 23 to 24 right so when the temperature is above, around that range we take the calorimeter out of the beaker and now we clean the outer surface of the calorimeter and measure its mass right so next what we do is that 
we record the temperature of water in the boiler when steam passes over the emergency tube now you have to know that the temperature of the water should not exceed 100 degrees celsius because uh, it just ex it should just exceed actually actually it should not exceed right not just exceed it should not exceed because when it is exceeding right it's already in the gaseous state so we are thinking about the latent heat in which the temperature stays constant now when steam actually passes through at the first instance the temperature should be 100 degrees celsius which is the boiling point so the temperature should remain constant we can uh, control the flame so that the heat provided can be controlled and we can easily control the temperature so the temperature stays still at 100 degrees of celsius and we can assume that we can provide the latent heat assuming the temperature doesn't change so what you do next as the seventh step is that we connect the heat store so that steam from the store directly faces the water of the calorimeter then you can say that the, the steam passes from the heat store to the water surface and when the temperature of the water in the calorimeter increases by the same temperature as it was reduced at the beginning now uh, in say uh, the initial instant the temperature was 30 degrees of celsius so by adding ice we reduce that to 23 to 24 degrees of celsius now what we do here is that as the, as the initial temperature was 30 degrees of celsius we uh, pass steam right we enhance the passing of steam until the temperature is increased by 36 to 30, uh, increased say up to 36 or 37 degrees of celsius so in the at the beginning we decreased we decreased the temperature by 6 to 7 degrees of celsius by adding ice now we took again to the same temperature which which was the initial temperature say 30 degrees and we now increased it by 6 or 7 so i'll explain these two actually these two steps in the important point section as to why i did such uh, method right I, uh, what, uh, why i did such some steps like that so then you record the final temperature and you finally measure the mass of the water with the calorimeter so that you can use that equation finally to find the specific latent heat of vaporization of water all right so here are some important points as i mentioned a little while ago so here are some important points on take uh, doing doing the experiment so the first point is about the emergency tube so an emergency tube is used to prevent the accidents caused by rising pressure inside the boiler now inside the boiler now if you insert an emergency tube there you can measure the water level there right so when the pressure increases you know that according to p equals h rho g the density of water remains constant and the gravitational acceleration remains constant so the pressure is directly proportional to the water column so when pressure increases water tends to go up or water tends to rise in the water tube right or in the emergency tube so you can just take for your eye level the initial uh, height of water when you are starting the experiment and if you can periodically watch whether this level is completely for you can see whether the, this level is completely going up right for a long distance not by a small one or two centimeters but if it is going up say about by uh, five to six centimeters it's a huge rise you can control the temperature or you can control the bunsen burner so that the pressure inside the uh, the boiler doesn't change much right or there's no pressure uh, building up inside the boiler so the second point is that the tube that carries steam from the boiler to the store should be immersed as to a considerable depth in water inside the boiler. Also condensation of water inside the tube is minimized by covering this tube with heat insulator. Now you can see now when now as I mentioned in the concept of heat conduction when some heat is passed over a conductor some heat is lost. Now now you are not sending just uh, just you are not sending some heat now say you are taking a bunsen burner and you are keeping the bunsen burner at one end of a heat conductor at say 70 degrees of celsius so heat conducts through this conductor and final temperature would be something less than 70 degrees of celsius probably so what actually happens is that some heat may be uh, lost through the system while going from the open end to the closed end however that's actually a error an error when taking a measurement so what you have to do here is that to prevent the 
condensation of water because now water is uh, going through a steam so when it goes to the upper environment right uh, the environment's temperature is less than the temperature inside the tube so temperature outside the tube is less than the temperature inside the tube so due to this temperature difference water may condense within the tube that carries from the boiler to the heat store before providing the correct the accurate amount of accurate mass of steam to the heat stove so to take the same mass from the tube that uh, originated the steam to that of the heat stove what you do is uh, as to carry all those mass what you do is we minimize uh, by in by covering with heat insulator so that water doesn't condense so the same mass say 10 grams of uh, 10 grams of mass right a small mass of uh, steam was passed from the boiler and the same mass we can assume that the same mass was received at the heat store or the other end so the third point is the inlet and the outlet tubes in the heat store should be placed at some distance not in the same line this is because steam tends to move directly towards the calorimeter without itself spreading inside the store also the outlet should be fixed at some height above the lower end of the store otherwise condensed water inside the store may enter the calorimeter so this is also an important step in which we place the inlet and the outlet separately not in a straight line so if the inlet and the outlet is in a straight line there is actually no use of the heat store and there may be errors so steam directly passes to the calorimeter without distributing in inside the heat store and also the outlet should be faced at some height above the low end because if the outlet is actually drowned inside or immersed in water what happens is that now the water the water in the calorimeter is at a temperature less than the temperature that is provided by heat so again due to that temperature difference water may condense inside water not providing the same heat or the same steam as required to the calorimeter so steam should not be sent to the calorimeter until it's thoroughly distributed inside the heat store otherwise when excess water from the store enters the calorimeter the latent heat cannot be obtained so that's ex i explained in the last point as well the outlet from the store should not be immersed in water so i explained that as well if we immerse the part that is immersed becomes cooler than the other part so that's the reason as to why water condenses the calorimeter should not be closed with the lid when the calorimeter is closed the steam gives the latent heat to the lid instead to the calorimeter and the condensed water on the lid may fall on the water in the calorimeter so what actually happens when you are closing it with the lid is that you now convection small convection currents or small vaporization currents may be formed from the surface of water in the calorimeter to the lid so water what actually happens is that uh, the condensed water on the lid may fall on the water in the, in the calorimeter so the mass of mass that we are measuring may be inaccurate so to prevent that we should not close the calorimeter with the lid and as best the sheet is used to prevent the heat from the burner entering the region of the calorimeter so if the heat enters the region of the calorimeter the temperature of that region may increase giving rise to inaccurate temperatures so to prevent that we use a simple asbestos sheet or any other covering so that heat doesn't enter that region now this is the reason as to why i explained a little while ago when the steam is started to send at a temperature of 6 to 7 degrees of 7 below room temperature so we do that by adding ice and so sending when the temperature is 6 to 7 degrees Celsius above room temperature the heat gain at first is almost equal to the heat loss in the end thus the net heat change can be assumed zero so that's the reason as to why we put ice cubes here so we are not measuring something of ice but we put ice cubes to reduce the temperature by 6 to 7 degrees from room temperature and then we increase the temperature by 6 to 7 degrees finally so heat gain when the temperature is lost is now equal heat loss when the temperature is increased so what actually happens is that the heat when the heat gain and the heat loss are equal the net heat change is zero now it is very uh, it's also actually analogous to the situation in which the system just stayed at the room temperature you lost some say 100 joules of heat when it is increased and you gain heat when it is decreased by adding ice so the net heat change is almost zero so that's the reason as to why uh, now in order to apply that equation we assume that now in order to find the value of l we assume that the heat loss to the environment is zero so to assume that we need such a step to be done 
So since the latent heat of vaporization of water is greater than the specific heat capacities of water and the calorimeter, greater care should be taken when measuring the mass of steam. All right. So when the mass of steam is measured inaccurately, you can say from that equation, from this equation, from this equation. Now, when you take this term, when you take this term to this side, when you take this term to this side, uh, m3 minus m2 times L will be equal to this and this product and the subtraction of this term from this product. So L is now equal to m1c plus m2 minus m1 times cw times t2 minus t1 the whole term minus m3 minus m2 times cw times 100 minus theta 2 divided by m3 minus m2. <coughs> so when the value of the actually the value of m3 changes the value of m3 is inaccurate this m3 minus m2 may, dif may be different so you know that l is now inversely proportional to the difference between m3 and m2 so when m3 is measured differently or inaccurately you can say that m3 minus m2 1 upon m3 minus m2 may give to a large extent of error on the calculation of even a small error when measuring this mass would result in a large percentage error in the value of the latent heat. So that's it about the concept of latent heat of vaporization. So in this video I explained to you about a simple experiment on which we found the latent heat of vaporization. I explained to you what is meant by latent heat, latent heat of vaporization and a simple experiment. So in the next video as I uh, told you at the beginning I will be uh, planning another uh, experiment about the latent heat of fusion and thanks for watching this video and see you then.